Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope everyone had a relaxing and peaceful Easter and Passover weekend. I know it's not easy to be physically distant from friends and loved ones, especially during occasions such as this. But I am grateful to all of Arizonans for acting responsibly, and you're doing great on the physical distancing and the stay-at-home order, and you've really shown that you do your part to slow the spread of, of COVID-19. Today, I want to touch on three key areas. Uh, the latest in our efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19 and prepare for the future. An update on efforts to ramp up new forms of testing in Arizona. And our plans for economic recovery. First, our preparations. Last week, we announced a plan to reopen St. Luke's Hospital with 339 additional beds that can range from low, low acuity to ICU beds. We've identified additional sites in Maricopa, Coconino, and Pima counties that will pr provide flexible and scalable bed capacity. Arizona also received a commitment of 100 additional ventilators to be deployed in critical need areas, including Navajo Nation and other tribal nations if necessary. I want to thank Senator Martha McSally for her help in advocating for these ventilators and to President Trump for authorizing FEMA to send them here. Like additional bed capacity, it's our hope that we won't ever need to use these devices, but we have them in case we do. Today we've take, taken additional steps to help Arizonans remain physically distance, distant while expanding access to health care. To start, I signed an executive order helping more people get certified as caregivers in assisted living facilities at a time when these positions are in high demand. I've also allowed for additional surveillance by DHS so we can better track the cases of COVID-19 in Arizona and how our medical personnel are treating this disease, as well as data sharing with law enforcement so our public safety personnel can take precautions just like medical personnel. And I signed an executive order expanding Arizona's actions to make telemedicine available by requiring workers' comp plans to cover it. These steps and more are part of Arizona's all-hands-on-deck approach to COVID-19. Now, stopping the spread, public health, COVID-19 remains our number one priority and will continue to be as long as it's needed. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Christ for the latest, followed by Major General Mick McGuire. Dr. Christ. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I wanna to begin today by providing a briefing on the number of confirmed cases an update on testing, and then I'd like to provide an overview of the increased data that we are receiving as part of the governor's enhanced surveillance order. To date, in Arizona, there have been 3,806 cases of COVID-19 in all 15 counties. And sadly, we've seen 131 deaths. On testing, to date, we have had 44,096 tests administered in Arizona. As we continue to evaluate the national supply of testing materials, we will continue to prioritize testing for the most high-risk Arizonans and those on the front lines, our first responders and our healthcare providers. We're continuing to look for ways to expand availability of testing, and we're excited for you to hear more about the governor's announcements on that topic today. As we continue to collect more data about the COVID-19 outbreak in Arizona, we will continue to enhance the information we're reporting on our website. We wanted to show some of the tools we use and the data that we're seeing from a high level. The epidemiology curve for COVID-19 shows how the trend of the outbreak has evolved in Arizona, including the increase in the number of cases and the impact that our interventions have had. Our primary goal is to slow the spread of the disease and prevent illnesses in people who are at highest risk for developing complications while protecting the healthcare system for a surge in patients. 
In addition to the monitoring the confirmed cases, we're also watching COVID-like illnesses. This shows the, the percent of inpatient and emergency room patients who come to our hospitals each week with symptoms that are compatible with COVID or COVID-like illness, which includes fever or chills with cough, difficulty breathing, or shortness of breath. Over the last few weeks, we've seen a downward trend of these visits for COVID-like illness in both emergency rooms and inpatient settings. As with the trend in our disease outbreak curve, this is encouraging data, but it does not indicate that we have stopped the outbreak. Everyone needs to remain vigilant and about being physically distanced. With all of our mitigation strategies, our primary goal has been to protect Arizona's healthcare system from a surge of cases. We wanna ensure everyone who needs access to care has it. In order to do this, we're closely monitoring the health of our healthcare system, including the number of inpatient and ICU beds in use and available, and the number of ventilators in use and available statewide. Please note that this data that I'm going to show you right now is using actuals and does not include the surge capacity that our hospitals have added to prepare for that potential surge. Um, when the surge capacity is contemplated, the capacity within our hospitals looks even more optimistic. As we look at our capacity for inpatient beds in Arizona, we see that over 25% have remained available with some of this and up to 40% remain available with some of the surge capacity created by our hospitals. The bright red bars at the bottom on the far end, those indicate the number of beds used by those with or suspected to have COVID. So we just started receiving this data, but we'll continue to track it moving forward. Based on that data through yesterday, COVID patients account for less than 10% of the total inpatient beds each day. When you look at the graph that shows the status of our ICU beds, our data shows that there is still capacity within our ICU beds. On recent days, we have currently over 25% of our ICU beds in the state available for Arizonans who need them, and with some of the surge capacity up to 50%. The newly reported data shows that only 15 to 18% of our total ICU beds are in use by COVID patients. And we'll be posting these graphs on, on the web. When we look at our availability of ventilators in Arizona, the data is very promising. Of our 1,500 ventilators statewide, we currently have approximately 75% available. COVID patients account for approximately 50% of the vents that are in use statewide. So this is something that we're going to monitor closely as this outbreak progresses. However, this is a much more reassuring position to be in than compared to the information that we had at the beginning of March, which was prior to the required reporting when we had 172 ventilators reported to the department with 100% of those being in use. While we still might need additional ventilators to meet the overall demand at our peak, we continue to evaluate this data to gain situational awareness and make decisions. We really appreciate our hospital partners for their diligent reporting of this data every single day. As this situation evolves, we'll continue to gather more data and we will include it on our website so that the public can better understand the outbreak and how we're working with our healthcare partners to pre prepare for a potential surge in cases. It has been more than two weeks since Governor Ducey announced the stay home, stay healthy, stay connected order. And I wanna say thank you to everyone who is doing their part to help slow the spread of COVID-19 in Arizona. I will now hand it over to Major General McGuire. Thank you. Good afternoon. I wanna give you a quick update about three topics uh, about the operations of the Department of Emergency and Military Affairs and uh, where we're at as a state as we uh, continue to manage this crisis. Uh, many of you uh, are aware that there's been a significant outbreak in Northeastern Arizona on the Navajo Nation. And uh, since we last uh, met on Thursday, uh, there was a request that was validated about getting potable water to uh, the tribal nation uh, up in Navajo, uh, Navajo County. Uh, the decision was made uh, that we had uh, access to potable water activity uh, and potable water trucks through what we use through forestry and fire management as we fight wildfires. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that we were able to get three sites to deliver uh, uh, water on the nation uh, at Chinle, Daikon, and the Kayenta area, what, which will allow uh, those citizens most affected in our state to get access to fresh, clean, uh, drinkable water. 
ad additionally, we made the decision over the weekend to deploy an incident management team to be an assistant of uh, President Nez and Vice President Lizer, as well as the incident commander there, uh, the incident commander Nez, uh, on the tribal nation. And uh, that team is comprised of uh, National Guardsmen as well as emergency management professionals, synchronizing the whole of government and whole of community response. Uh, the Navajo Nation creates a challenging problem in that it, it overlies three states and three FEMA regions, FEMA Region 9, FEMA Region 6, FEMA Region 8, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And uh, three quarters of those folks are here in the great state of Arizona. They're our neighbors, they're our partners. And so the decision is made, made by the uh, uh, regional administrator, Mr. Robert Fenton, to have Region 9 take the lead in coordinating all those resource requests, working with Indian Health Service and the 638 facilities. One of the huge demands that we've had a challenge with getting up there is uh, PPE, that personal protective equipment. And I wanna share a good news story about that. Uh, we were able in the last week to obtain fabric with the help of uh, Governor Ducey and um, the uh, Commerce Authority, Ms. Sandra Watson, to link up both Dignity and Banner Health with local uh, fabric companies uh, to uh, stitch together the gowns that we need. Ironically, surgical gowns are in uh, shorter supply right now than even the masks, so we're gonna have the ability to organically produce those here in the state. When they first uh, received the material, the projected date of delivery was this Friday. We were able to get uh, federal authorization through FEMA to use uh, Arizona National Guard assets in the 161st, obtain the fabric, uh, and as of today, uh, the FDA has given approval to the pattern and design that they're using and uh, should be uh, producing and getting those to healthcare workers by Friday of this week when we were originally gonna receive the fabric on Friday. And uh, that's a great whole of community, whole of government uh, response, uh, much like what we've seen uh, in 1942 that the whole of community pulling together to uh, overcome this crisis. Uh, finally, in a worst case scenario, in the event that we would need critical care beyond what our capabilities are, uh, we are uh, under construction now at St. Luke's and three weeks from yesterday, we should be ready to habit that for high acuity patients in the event that a local healthcare facility should have that need. Uh, so we're working hard with the Army Corps of Engineers to get that done, and uh, uh, Dr. Chris team has taken the lead on staffing that and through uh, contracts and getting people ready in the event a local hospital uh, uh, needs that assistance. We all pray that that doesn't happen, but we wanna be ready for a worst case scenario. And with that, uh, Governor Ducey. Thanks very much, General McGuire and, and Dr. Christ. Uh, next topic, testing. Arizona's public first in the nation to be certified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, to test for COVID-19 on March 2nd. Since then, our private sector partners, including Banner Health, SonoraQuest, LabCorp, TGen, and Mayo Clinic, have begun conducting COVID-19 tests, resulting in over 44,000 tests completed so far. But we need more, a lot more. And there's not a governor in the country who doesn't need more testing. With a greater availability of tests and more rapid turnaround of results. Last week, we announced that Arizona has received all 15 of the Abbott testing machines allotted to our state. These machines can detect COVID-19 in as little as 15 minutes, and they'll be distributed around the state to test vulnerable populations. Today also we're announcing that Walgreens, and thank you Walgreens, has chosen Arizona as one of 14 states to open drive-through testing operations. And we're one of only seven states receiving two of these sites in Arizona. In addition to more diagnostic testing, nationally there's been talk about what's called antibody testing. It's a blood test which has the potential to determine if someone has been exposed to the virus, had COVID-19 and recovered. I'm certain we all know people that were sick in January or early February and wonder if they indeed did have COVID-19. Here in Arizona, we're not just talking about that, we're taking action for our citizens. That's why I'm pleased to announce a new partnership with the University of Arizona 
to make an initial 150,000. That's 250,000 of these antibody tests available for Arizonans, starting with our frontline medical personnel and first responders. Now, antibody testing is not a cure-all, but it's an important step to exposing identity, uh, to, to identifying community exposure, helping us make decisions about how we protect our citizens and getting us to the other side of this pandemic more quickly. Our health workers and first responders are on the front lines, and my top priority is to identify ways to protect them, and I'm eager to get this underway. It's my special honor to have University of Arizona President Dr. Bobby Robbins with us here today. Dr. Robbins and his team at the University of Arizona have been leaders in researching and developing this science, which can really be a game changer in this fight. We're going to be working with them to get approval for this testing from the federal government as quickly as possible. Arizona State University and Northern Arizona University are also thinking big as they step up to provide solutions. At ASU's Biodesign Institute, researchers are using robots to develop a process to test high sample volumes simultaneously. At NAU, they are partnering with Guardian Air to 3D print personal protective masks for Flagstaff's medical professionals. These are just some of the efforts taking place at Arizona's public universities. We couldn't be more grateful to have these world-class institutions in our own backyard. I want to thank ASU President Michael Crow and NAU President Rita Chang for their partnership and leadership during this time, along with Dr. Bobby Robbins from the University of Arizona. Dr. Robbins became president of the University of Arizona in 2017. Before that, he led as president and CEO of the largest medical complex in the world, the Texas Medical Center in Houston, and served in other health leadership positions, including chairman of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's an internationally recognized cardiac surgeon who's authored over 300 peer-reviewed articles. And his eye for innovation is already making a difference in Tucson and across the state of Arizona. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Robbins. Doctor? Thank you, Governor. And thank you for inviting me to be here today to, uh, to share this uh, story, which I think is really remarkable. Uh, March 11th, uh, we were playing basketball at the Pac-12 tournament. We were on spring break, but that day changed for all of us. We made the decision that day not to invite our students back to campus, for them to stay at home. We made the decision to go to an all-digital, remote, teaching and learning platform, and I couldn't be prouder that in a week when students uh, re-engaged in classes that following Wednesday after spring break, that our staff, our faculty, our students took forward this uh, challenge of going to an all digital format. I'm happy to report that we're thriving at the University of Arizona. Uh, students are learning, they're gonna finish their degrees. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have our fantastic graduation ceremony in Arizona Stadium on May 15th, but we have something special planned for our students. By March 17th, Governor Ducey and Dr. Chris made their way to Tucson, and we shared with them uh, our ideas about what we were going to do because we had no idea how many students were actually going to return to campus. Uh, fortunately, we only have about five or 600 students in our residential uh, living facilities, but I didn't know if we were gonna have five to 10,000, which we normally do. So we wanted to be self-sufficient. We wanted to not depend on being at the end of the uh, uh, supply chain uh, to have tests. So we began to manufacture swabs in our own labs, in our virology labs at the University of Arizona. Moreover, on a parallel path, uh, we began to develop a, uh, an antibody test. 
one that is a blood test. It's not a finger prick that the governor just talked about, which is a great test. It can only provide information about if you have the infection that day. It's an RT-PCR test that looks for viral shedding. This test that the governor just described to you is a blood test. It's an antibody test. We, will, uh, we have plans to test every one of our faculty members, our staff members, and our students. That's 60,000 people. It'll be voluntary. Uh, my sense is that most people want to know this data. And for us to get out in front of this disease into the next phase, shelter in place, mitigation, governor, all the things that you've done here have been the right thing. Uh, and, and we've been fortunate in Arizona not to suffer like some of the other states uh, in this great country. But this blood test will be able to, to inform us about who has the infection. Early on, once you get the infection, you have, uh, your body makes antibodies called IgM antibodies. And then about seven to 10 days later, uh, you start to make IgG antibodies. So we think that we, by doing this test, will get valuable information about uh, who, has, who has the disease and who has had it in the past uh, and has uh, antibody production, uh, potentially inferring uh, immunity. If we go back to MERS, if we go back to SARS, H1N1, we know from uh, data that you probably have about a year's worth of uh, antibody protection in the MERS case, and for SARS, about three years worth of antibodies. So we can't guarantee you'll have immunity, but we need to get the data because uh, knowledge is power, and we feel that empowering our students, our faculty and staff is really important. As we had that discussion on St. Patrick's Day in Tucson, and shared our plans with uh, Governor Ducey and Dr. Chris. They said, can you, can you expand this? Can you scale it? And we said, absolutely, we can do that. So going forward, we're happy to partner with the governor's office uh, to expand uh, testing uh, to up to 250,000 people. We'll decide after that, once that happens, we think we can do that within a month. Uh, we'll be ready to go uh, sometime next week at the latest by May 1st to begin rolling this test out. So Governor, thank you for the partnership. Thank you for inviting me here today. I, I just wanted to take one minute. Uh, one of my friends told me, you know, what are you doing? You're going from the operating room to, uh, to a university presidency. You've become a Pentagon general. I wanna tell you who our frontline generals are. Uh, my longtime friend, Michael Dake, is our senior vice president for health affairs at the University of Arizona. He is our uh, frontline battle-tested general who's been quarterbacking this effort for us. Uh, also, we're fortunate to have Dr. Mike Abacasis, uh, who is the dean of the College of Medicine in Tucson, uh, who led the transplant program at Northwestern University for almost three decades. Ironically, Governor, he did his master's thesis on the coronavirus. So we're lucky to have both of them. In addition to Dr. Uh, Yanko Nikolic Zukic, who is the uh, head of our immunology department, Yanko has done a great job stepping up. Ryan Spisler, who uh, is also in the Arizona Genomics Corps, Dr. Uh, Deepat uh, Bhattachari, who is associate professor in immunology, and uh, Dr. David Harris, who directs our Arizona Health Sciences Biorepository, and finally, Dr. Catherine Spear, Professor of Pathology. Those are the people who are gonna make this work for you, Governor, and we couldn't be more excited to be your partner. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Robinson. Thank you for the, the talented team from the U of A stepping up with this in, innovative uh, uh, approach. Uh, we're excited to deploy it. Uh, next, let's talk economic recovery in the state of Arizona. Now, as we look ahead, many are asking, when can we get back to normal in this state? My answer is I want to get there as soon as possible. I want to see everyone get back to work and back with their lives when it is safe and healthy to do so. Arizona's stay home, stay healthy, and stay connected order is in place until April 30th. As we get closer to that date, we will be tracking even more closely 
the data, and continuing to work with public health officials on what comes next. We also want to plan ahead and be ready when the time comes to restart sections of our economy. That's why just moments ago I sent letters to leaders in our business community seeking their input on a plan for economic recovery. Our goal is to be able to make the right decisions at the right time while continuing to be guided by public health and safety along with public health experts with Dr. Christ at my right hand and watching the data as we approach that date. At this time, I want to introduce two leaders. I've assigned to spearhead the outreach effort. Sandra Watson of the Arizona Commerce Authority and Debbie Johnson of the Arizona Department of Tourism. They're going to engage leaders in lodging, restaurant, retail, and tourism sectors to get more of their feedback. And they're going to talk a little bit about what they're already hearing from our business community. Sandra? Thank you, Governor Ducey. From the moment it became evident that COVID-19 was going to place an unprecedented strain on our economy, the Arizona Commerce Authority has been working to help businesses statewide navigate this crisis. Under Governor Ducey's leadership, the ACA quickly deployed a comprehensive and intentional strategy to support businesses. We are regularly convening industry and community leaders to share knowledge and to collaborate on ways to provide relief, with a particular focus on our small businesses that have been hit the hardest. These small businesses are the backbone of our economy, and we are laser focused on helping them get through this. Our team is on call 24-7 providing personalized support to those who have questions and need guidance. Providing resources to affected workers is equally important, and the ACA's statewide workforce development team has been heavily engaged in leading these efforts. We're, we're very proud of the partnerships that we've led with the Arizona Office of Tourism and the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce to, dis, to connect displaced hospitality and service industry workers with grocery, health care, financial services, and manufacturing jobs. Over 8,000 open positions in these industries alone have been identified. To get them filled quickly, We've created a COVID-19 rapid response team in partnership with Arizona at Work and the Department of Economic Security. This team is proactively implementing workforce retention, reemployment, and retraining initiatives supporting employers like Honeywell, which is seeking to hire more than 500 new workers for its N95 Mass Phoenix operation and to provide a centralized hub for the latest information, the ACA created a COVID-19 business resource section on our web website, both in English and in Spanish, which we update daily. To ensure this information reaches every Arizona business, the ACA has launched an integrated statewide marketing campaign, and we're grateful to the partners who have joined us in a cooperative effort to amplify the messaging. As we look to the future and plan ahead for Arizona's economic recovery, our strategy will continue to be multifaceted and collaborative. As Governor Ducey has stated, public health will be at the forefront of everything we do. We will continue to follow the governor's lead as well as the guidance of Dr. Christ and the Arizona Department of Health Services. Gathering input from industry and partners statewide will be a key component of this effort and will help us make the most informed, pragmatic decisions possible for this state. While we have a great deal of work ahead of us, Arizona has recovered from tough economic times before. Under Governor Ducey's leadership, I have complete confidence that we will overcome this challenge together, becoming stronger and more resilient as a result. 
Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Arizona Office of Tourism Director Debbie Johnson, who has been an incredible partner in our efforts. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited to be involved in the support of Governor Ducey's efforts to re-energize our economy. Tourism plays an important role in Arizona's economy. It positively impacts all 15 counties and 22 tribal nations. It contributed nearly a billion dollars to the state's general fund in 2018, and it is directly linked to more than 192,000 jobs in our state. As we continue to work to combat the spread of COVID-19, we face an unprecedented uphill battle to get our economy back on track. Tourism has and will continue to be one of the hardest hit industries in our state. Last month alone, more than 40% of Arizona's hospitality and tourism workforce was laid off or furloughed, totaling more than 75,000 individuals. From March 1st to April 4th, Arizona lost $1.2 billion in visitor spending and $35 million in state tax revenue. So while the statistics paint a gloomy picture, we know that when Arizonans work together, we can overcome some of our greatest challenges. Together, as Sandra mentioned, with the Arizona Commerce Authority, we created ArizonaTourismJobs.com, an opportunity to connect displaced workers with industries currently hiring, grocery stores, healthcare providers, hospitals. It's available in English and Spanish, and as Sandra mentioned, it is updated regularly with new jobs and new opportunities that we are hearing about on a regular basis. We all know that the world looked very different six weeks ago, and this new reality requires a new approach. Today, statewide tourism industry leaders will be asked to share their expertise and ideas for our state's economic recovery process to support the tourism industry. The collaborative input that we receive will be completed, shared with the governor, and put into action alongside an AOT-led statewide long-term tourism recovery plan that we're working on. Both of these efforts are vitally important and will become the short and long-term recovery plans for Arizona's tourism industry. I look forward to working with the governor's office and leaders around the state to get people back to work, safely deploying CDC guidelines, and get our economy back to business. Governor, thank you. Th thanks very much, Sandra, and thank you, Debbie. Uh, I'll co conclude today by asking every Arizona to keep doing what you're doing. Staying at home, washing your hands, covering your cough, and staying connected. It's working, and we're going to stay the course. I know this has been a very tough time, very tough month plus for the state of Arizona and for our country, but there is a light at the end of this tunnel, and we're heading towards it. Uh, and with that, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, Howie, go ahead and ask your question. Um, I appreciate the information your department has provided and the database they provide on zip code. Why can't we get information about nursing homes? We're not talking about individual patients. We're talking about nursing homes with 30, 40, 50, 80 people. My mother happens to be in the assisted living facility. What is it that you believe is, exists in HIPAA that precludes us from knowing that the, the terraces where my mother is has these many cases of COVID-19? The address or a facility where someone would live would be protected health information. And so if your mother was the only one at the terraces that had COVID-like illness, anybody at the terraces then could identify that that was the patient. So we consider that protected health information. But the, the address is of a multiple, it's, it's not by the order of zip codes, it's the order of if you have 100 people there, this is a huge facility. Um, it's if anybody could identify that individual. And so how do you determine that? If, I mean, again, again, my mm -hmm. mother is one of perhaps 150 people in this facility. So again, why can't I find out whether there are people in this facility who have COVID-19? We will be working with the facilities to make sure that they are working with their residents and the families and the loved ones to let them know about what's going on within that facility, but it's not information that the department can give out. Okay, 
Andrew? Yeah, Governor, what would you say to conservatives, even many in your own party, who would say that actually your response to some of these orders have maybe gone too far, that it shouldn't be up to the state to decide whether this is open or closed, that kind of thing? Well, I, I want to say that uh, every d decision that we have made along the way has been d done with, with great thought uh, and concern for the, the health and, and welfare of, of Arizonans. I've, uh, I take the responsibility that I have as, as governor very seriously. And to declare a, a public health e emergency uh, gives broad authorities. I have tried to be as, as reasonable uh, with a sense of urgency so that Arizona could stay out ahead of this uh, along the way. Of course, we're uh, consulting with, with legal authorities, and I want uh, people to know that uh, none of these decisions have been easy to make. I believe all of them have been the right decision to make, and we've always wanted to be one step ahead of where we needed to be. We were able to look and learn from places like uh, Seattle and the nursing home incident that they had there, of course, what's going on in, in New York State and Louisiana and Detroit, and we have been able to avoid that in the state of Arizona. Now, when we get on the other side of this pandemic, and we will get there, it's just a matter of time. Uh, these orders and, and authorities evaporate, and they go away, and we will be getting as close as back to normal or, or better uh, than, than normal, but th this uh, uh, decision-making and authority uh, comes with the job, and I've embraced it. So we'll be sharing that modeling. I'm, I'm trying to get it to a um, non-PhD level uh, of information. So it should be in the next day or two. Um, we will be sharing that, and we'll be sharing all of the data that goes along with that um, so that people can see. We will. Um, we are working on getting widespread testing. We were very excited about Walgreens. We're in conversations with CVS to open up some additional testing. And as soon as we get um, more test collection supplies, that's when we'll be able to open it up to everybody. But we, we shouldn't be talking about opening things back up when we have no idea what's out there, correct? Let me address that. Uh, of course we should be talking about opening things up. Uh, and I've been thinking about opening things up uh, every day while public health came first, but there's just no way uh, that we continue like this forever. So the idea of, of finding when it is safe and responsible to do it and to be prepared at that time. And the other thing uh, around the question is I want to make sure that there's no false narrative out there. I mean, COVID-19 is widespread in this country, everywhere, in all 50 states. I think it's in, last count, in 190 nations. So as much as we want to stop COVID-19, it's out there. And it's something that we're going to have to deal with in a way that's responsible to make sure people that contract it and need hospital care can have hospital care. If you refer to the graphs that Dr. Christ went through, today we can take care of sick people with a lot of capacity. Not only do we have the personal protective equipment, we have uh, ventilators, and you mentioned taxpayer dollars. What better use could there be of taxpayer dollars than to prepare for the people of Arizona in a pandemic. So yes, that's what we're doing, and at the appropriate time, when it's safe, we will begin uh, to re-energize our economy one step at a time. 
It's not like turning off a light switch and turning on a light switch. It's about making the right decisions at the right time. And yeah, we'll be talking about it every day and we'll be thinking about it every day. We're, we're always going to be worried about more people being sick. We also want to make sure that we can care for people that are sick. There are, COVID-19 is top of mind right now. It's our number one priority. There's lots of things that people get sick from in, in the United States and Arizona. Matt, first and real quick one. Uh, where, when, and capacity for the Walgreens? Uh, in terms of the details on, on the Walgreens, do, do you know that, Dr. Christ? I know that we, there will be... Uh, uh, we're going to have the drive-through testing uh, in, in Arizona, and we're uh, only uh, there, there's only uh, several states where, where they're, they're going to have extra locations in which to do that. I don't know that those locations have yet been determined. As soon as they are, they'll be on the uh, azhealth.gov website. And I want to go uh, kind of back to commerce and tourism. What have your discussions been like with Major League Baseball? Some plans, every team here, some plans, half the spring training teams here, half in Florida. What have your discussions been like? Are you on board with that? Well, I want to... Uh touch on that. Uh, everyone knows that Arizona very proudly ho hosts 15 Major League Baseball franchises in Arizona every spring in the, in the Cactus League for spring training. Uh, we love having all of those clubs here. It's, uh, I think, many Arizonans' favorite time of the year. This year, in the response to COVID-19, spring training shut down and all those clubs went home, and opening day was delayed. Uh, I have had discussions with the commissioner of, of Major League Baseball, and while I wanna hold the, the content of those discussions in, in confidence, I just want everyone to know that uh, Arizona, at the right time, is very open-minded to hosting whatever Major League Baseball would like from the state uh, at the time that it would be appropriate for public health. If Arizona were in a position to, to reopen, we have the facilities that are here, we have the hotel space that is here, we're gonna wanna make certain that the, the metrics and the data are proper before we were able to go forward. But I think two words that would allow the country and the state of Arizona to know that things were headed back to normal would be play ball. It sounds like you wanted to There's a number of different scenarios. I think the first scenario that was talked about was the idea of, of these clubs coming, being in hotels in, in a way, having their own stay-at-home orders where they'd either be at the hotel or inside the stadium with, without fans. That, that, that was the first discussion. We're, we're not, like I said, it's April 14th here uh, today. The order runs through April 30th. We're going to know a lot more about where we are and where the nation is each day as April unfolds. But it would be something that I think would be, uh, it's something that Arizona is open-minded to, and I'm open-minded to. Hello, can you hear me? I can't hear you, so I'll just go ahead. Uh, Governor, Dr. Chris, uh, experts I've spoken to and many of us have spoken to have talked about the need for testing and tracing before we reopen the economy. Um, it sounds like you're talking about testing uh, and expanding its availability. What about the ability to trace the contacts of people who uh, are infected or test positive? Is there an expansion in that in the offering? So let me uh, touch on testing, and then I'm going to let uh, Dr. Christ and, and uh, Dr. Robbins, if you would like to chime in as, as well. Uh, we need additional testing in, in Arizona. We're at 44,000 plus test to date, but we do need more, uh, and every governor wants more. Uh, of course, we want the frontline professionals. This is the doctors and the nurses and the emergency medical personnel, uh, our police officers, our correctional officers. Dr. Robbins talks about testing every student at the University of Arizona. So that's something that we're going to be focused on. Uh, and it's not only the diagnostic testing, it's the antibody testing. I know my uh, uh, my wife was very sick uh, in uh, late January, along with my middle son, Joe. My mom 
was incredibly sick in uh, mid-January. Did they have COVID-19? We don't know, but that's what the antibody testing would tell us, and it also tells them and others inside our state uh, different things that, that they are able to do. I'm gonna let Dr. Chris talk about the testing and uh, if Dr. Robbins could touch on the 250,000 tests and, and how we could ramp that and how that would also work with, with uh, uh, ideas around tracing. So we continue to explore um, how to increase testing and I, the serology will give us a, a really good idea of community exposure and we're currently exploring increasing um, the contact tracing of, of positive cases as well to answer that other question. I'll turn it over to Dr. Robbins to talk to, about the serology project. Yeah, as I said in my opening uh, comments, uh, we think it's really important to get antibody uh, testing done. Um, I, I agree with the, uh, the case uh, tracing. Um, you know, I'm intrigued uh, by what Apple and Google are talking about with iPhones and Androids to be able to find uh, people that uh, go in and say they, they've tested positively uh, so that you can track this down. But, but I think testing is the next thing that's gonna be the most important variable uh, we could introduce uh, into this uh, uh, equation. Uh, I, I think that uh, we're going to need to continue to do uh, the rapid uh, uh, testing at Walgreens and CVS. I think it's a great idea. Again, that tells you if you're infected at that time. This antibody test, the serological test, will measure antibodies that will let you know if you're actively infected or if you've been infected in the past. Uh, Governor, I, I think I'm gonna be the first one that will volunteer to get blood drawn next Monday. Uh, I'm gonna film it, let everybody see how that all works. Uh, and I, uh, I never bet much, uh, usually no more than a dollar, but I bet I've got the antibodies because I, even though I never had fever, I never uh, had a cough, um, I, I think that in the, all the contacts I've had, I would be surprised if I don't have the, uh, the antibody. And that, of course, is uh, something we need to know because probably the most dangerous people are the asymptomatic carriers, the so-called vectors that can pass the, uh, pass the virus along without being symptomatic. We're still gonna need the testing uh, for point, care, point of care testing without a blood draw, which is what this antibody test is. And I think the Walgreens and CVS and others, the Abbott testing kits are gonna be really important. But that again, just tells you if you've got the disease that day. Um, you need to be tested multiple times uh, uh, because if you get symptoms, then you need to return back to your healthcare provider and, and get another test. With a serological test, it tells you if you've had it and the chance of being reinfected is, uh, is really small. So I think that's the utility of, of the antibody test. Thanks, Doc. We're gonna do one more question from the board. Russ Wiles from the Arizona Republic, go ahead, Russ. Hello, Governor? Hi, Hi, Russ. Hi, I was just wondering, Russ Wilds, Arizona Republic, I was just wondering if you can tell me, in terms of reopening the economy, whether Arizona might join with other states in planning that process, such as the Western States Act uh, involving uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Russ, uh, I don't. Uh I, I don't see the need for Arizona to have to join uh, any any coalition uh, re regarding uh, our economic reopening uh, growth and, and development. Uh, this is something, of course, I uh, get a chance to talk with all these governors a couple times a week and have a, a good relationship with these governors where we can share best ideas and, and best practices. But Arizona was leading in economic uh, growth and development going into this downturn and Arizona's expectation is going to lead on the way out at the appropriate time. Uh, 
You know, my, my message to uh, uh, everyone in Arizona has been the, the same consistently since since this began. Uh, we're working with our federal partners so that we can make certain that our, our paycheck to paycheck employees in the state of Arizona have access to these benefits. Of course, health care is going to be available to all Arizonans through this crisis. Uh, I don't have anything to add beyond that. I, we're going to make certain that nobody uh, falls through uh, the cracks in terms of health care. I mean, what we have right now is a health care crisis, and you can see by what's happening inside our hospitals and health care facilities right now, we're prepared and we have capacity. And for Dr. Chris, my next question was um, about COVID patients who have recovered. Is there any info on the percentage of patients we are um, currently working on that definition and are hoping to post it on our website on Sunday. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Governor, you keep mentioning the date April 30th, um, as if May 1st is an important date in making the transition. Do you see some significant changes coming on May 1st, or maybe slight changes coming to make this? Take our, take our lives back to normal. So, so, Bram, you mentioned April 30th, and the reason that I pointed that date out several times is that is the date uh, that Arizona extended its guidance to uh, in compliance with the Centers for Disease Control, and that also happened to be the White House guidance at the time. If uh, everyone remembers, we originally had nationally, and this was the national directive, was 15 days to slow the spread, and that order was... A, expanded until April 30th, which made it, I think, 45 days in total, which is uh, what we've been doing uh, even a little bit longer in Arizona. It's too early right now for me to say that there's something magical about May 1st. Of course, I'm hopeful. Uh, I want to be aspirational on this. But just as I made every responsible decision for the state of Arizona without regard to what other states were doing along the way. I want to make every responsible decision for Arizona without regard to what other states are doing for what's right for our state. And uh, uh, But April 30th is, is, is a date that we have uh, guidance and executive orders out until if those need to be extended, we'll extend them. If they can be changed, They'll be changed. Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, in response to that, you know, yesterday the president said that he's the one who calls the ball. He calls the shots on all this. Is he the boss here? Is he going to decide if Arizona gets to open up or not? Or are you the decider? So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't hear that, but I have read it and seen the reporting around it. Uh, I think what the the president uh, is. In, in charge of is what the national guidance is. You know, there's no, I can't give guidance to the nation. Uh, I can give it for Arizona. Uh, and a United States Senator can provide, uh, of course, whatever would inform these economic r relief packages, but there's gotta be a, a one guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and, uh, and, and that's what came not only from CDC, but if you'll remember that day in March where that changed to the White House guidance, that, that's what the president's in charge of. That date today coincides with Arizona's date of April 30th. I'm gonna continue to make the best decisions for Arizona. The president specifically mentioned governors that he's in charge of this. I mean, if he says open up tomorrow, you open up. What we do is make the best decision for Arizona. That's what we've done the entire time. And I think what I read is that the comment was that he's in charge of the national guidance, and that's accurate. <laughs> Well, I'm going to make the best decision for Arizona. So there's your answer. Okay, so no matter what for for Arizona, I'm going to make the best decision. No matter what the president says. Next question. Well, we we've 
In terms of PPE, we continue to work with our federal partners. Uh, President Trump called me personally last Wednesday uh, because he was aware of what was happening on, on Navajo Nation. Uh, and that's where, along with Senator McSally, was advocating for additional ventilators. So. I believe we've got a relationship with this administration where if we need more PPE, we can access more PPE. We're also acquiring things in, in the private sector. We're being resourceful ourselves. We're working with Honeywell right here in Arizona in Phoenix that's going to produce 6 million uh, N95 masks. Uh, I'd love to be in a position where I can say this uh, material that we have acquired is unnecessary for us in Arizona because many of these models keep pushing our peak dates out. We've been in acquisition mode, and like I said, it's only responsible and prudent in a pandemic to plan for a worst case scenario. Uh, if we have the data that says we're past that, we'll be in a position where we can sit today where we could send stuff back. Listen, I want to say it was 100 additional ventilators, and it's a shame that anyone would uh, uh, ascribe politics when the President of the United States has personal concern for what's happening in Navajo Nation on tribal lands that not only intersect Arizona, but also Utah and New Mexico. So we do expect there to be, as we've mitigated the, the infection, there's no way to completely eradicate the infection. It is all over the world. So we will continue to make the decisions based on what we are seeing in Arizona, based on the health of our healthcare system, the number and the rise of the tests that we have. So there's a lot of different information that we're looking at, and we'll continually make those decisions. While I would like a lot more data, um, on testing and the prevalence in our community. We've got a lot of data through our COVID-like illness, syndromic surveillance, the health of our healthcare system. That's really what we're going to, what we're trying to protect by doing these mitigation strategies. So as long as our healthcare system is protected, we'll continue to, to develop the strategies. And, and, and I want to clarify something, Nicole, t to your question. Uh, I just want you to know that Dr. Christ is not talking about reopening our economy. I'm talking about reopening our economy. Dr. Christ is focused on public health and COVID-19 100% of her time, 24 seven. My job encompasses uh, thinking about what's next and what's ahead. I'm the one thinking about that. And we're talking about this into the future. I just wanted to know yes. medical opinion without testing. Yes. Well, I think April 30th is a, a date to focus on because it's the date that our guidance statewide goes uh, until. A decision is going to have to be made sometime before April 30th, but until we, we have a lot of time until then. We don't want to provide, uh, we can be aspirational. We should, we're a hopeful people. We just got through a very hopeful uh, celebration on, on Sunday. Uh, we should continue to be hopeful and vigilant and prudent. And that's what we're going to do in Arizona. Last question here, Dennis. Uh, I got one question for Dr. Kerr and Dr. Chris. Um, obviously, there's not going to be a vaccine or effective treatment for quite some time. I just wanted to get your opinion. A lot of people are kind of wondering about this. This is an election year. People wondering if they should vote by mail or go and vote in person. In your opinion, medical I would like to see where we were with our um, 
with our infection at that time in order to be able to make um, that type of decision. I think it'll depend on if we get a second wave where we are with influenza at that time, um, because that's the start of our flu season as well. So we'll be taking all of that into account. And I, I really didn't know that uh, that voting was a medical decision. I thought it was a. I thought it was a. I thought it was a. I can I look. I want to answer the question. I'm going to answer the question, please, as asked. I'm going to answer the question as asked. Uh, voting is an individual right and liberty, and no one is better in the United States of America at it than the state of Arizona. Seventy-four percent of our citizens already vote by mail. And if people want to vote by mail in November, they have months and months and months in which to make that decision. We're not going to disenfranchise anyone from voting on Election Day. We're going to have more availability to vote, not less. Medically speaking, what's the greater chance of spreading the disease, going to a poll or maybe? We're on April 14th today, and you're, you're asking for, for medical profession, professionals. We're on April 14th, and you're asking for medical professionals to become fortune tellers. They're not going to do that. You have until October. You have until October. Um, we are not going to disenfranchise anyone in the state of Arizona. You couldn't find enough poll workers or enough cleaners to get enough... That's where we are. We're not disenfranchising anyone in Arizona. Governor, if you last question. I have time for one more minute. Sorry, I've got Zach here. This will be our last question. So it's multiple different models that show different peaks. And, and so if you look at the healthdata.org, which is the one that is on online, you can see what those peaks are. Um, with peaks going as high as our previous modeling, up to 13,000 um, hospital beds needed. It has, the mitigation strategies have pushed out potentially, so we're getting a range of dates that are farther out potentially as our peak. So healthdata.org just changed it to April 30th. Some of the modeling is showing now May. So we're going to put that out, but there's a whole range of almost all of the variables. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yep, thank you, Patrick. And I want to say in, in closing, just thank you to all Arizonans for your responsible and thoughtful behavior. The physical and social distancing is evident. The stay-at-home order is working. Please stay healthy, stay connected, and we will regularly update you 